Open your Bibles, please, to Matthew 13, 33. Jesus is speaking in Matthew 13 about the kingdom of God, and he does two little parables, one right after another. The first is the mustard seed, and the second is about leaven. He told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, that a woman took and hid in the three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Leaven is yeast, and I have done more research and have more understanding about what yeast is and what it does in the last week than I have my whole life. It's an amazing little beast. Yeast is a living creature. It is a one-celled organism. And yeast loves sugar. And you put yeast anywhere near sugar, and there's sugar in bread dough. There's sugar added to liquids to make beer and such. The yeast will eat the sugar, will convert the sugar, and will produce carbon dioxide, gas. And so if you have yeast in bread dough, bread dough is thick enough to capture that carbon dioxide gas. And so that's why when you have yeast in your bread, you have soft and fluffy bread that has little holes in it. If you have rustic bread that perhaps doesn't have the kneading or the... Uh, stuff of more store-bought bread, you'll have odd size or big old holes that are created by the gas of the yeast. If you let it go long enough in your bread in a drawer somewhere, it will actually convert the bread because the process of yeast eating sugar, and when yeast eats sugar, first thing it does is add little baby yeast, so you have more yeasts. And the second thing it does is to convert the sugar into an alcohol and produce carbon dioxide. And that process is called fermentation. Whenever yeast is involved in eating sugar, it is called fermentation. Now, in wheat bread, there are certain chemical things that go on that stop the creation of alcohol, but if you put it in your drawer and let it sit for a couple weeks, you'll open your drawer and you will have what is known as bread beer because your bread will turn into beer. It will turn into alcohol. Now, you can create with great you know, liquids and flavors all sorts of alcoholic beverages, and these things are all caused by yeast. Yeast is the agent that gives beer its bubbles and also gives beer it's alcohol. And so everywhere in the Bible, you go back to civilization, and the biggest civilization that is talked about is Egypt. Egypt had yeast. Egypt had yeasted bread. If you take bread dough and you bake it without yeast, you get a cracker. You have to put yeast in bread to make it a bread, to make it soft and fluffy and have little holes so you can make toast or whatever out of it. You need yeast in your bread, and this has been known for thousands upon thousands of years. Somebody way back discovered yeast, and from that, the world has changed. We consume a ton of yeast in our breads and in our various baked goods, uh, every year in this country, and the yeast makes more of itself. And so the change that yeast takes, the changes that take place in bread dough are phenomenal. They are molecular. It changes the molecular structure of the bread. We will talk a bit about that later. And some people have said, well, the disciples didn't know anything about molecules, didn't know anything about, you know, molecular changes, but Jesus did, and Jesus knew the history of yeast, and I don't think you have to know, say you're an ancient Egyptian, and you're making bread, you don't have to know why. You know you put this stuff in the dough, and the dough gets little holes in it, and it gets yummy, and it tastes great, and it doesn't fall apart, 
and the texture is good, and you don't care why, because last week you made this bread without that yeast, and it turned into a hard cracker. And so you know that the yeast is good and you don't care why. Now, because of our microscopes and stuff and, you know, chemical knowledge, we know exactly what yeast is doing. And I think Jesus, understanding what yeast does and is, was able to use it as an illustration 2,000 years ago when we understand even better what he was talking about. So how does it work? How did it work in the time of Jesus? You did not go to your neighborhood store and get yeast. Today you can go to the grocery store and you can buy yeast in all manner of configurations. You can buy frozen yeast. You can buy, most people will get the little package of Fleshman's freeze-dried yeast. That is the number one seller of yeast in America if you want to make your bread that way. You can get yeast in a paste. You can get yeast in a block. You can get yeast probably 60 different ways. I tried to read everything on the internet about how to buy yeast. And it's phenomenal how people package it so that you can make industrial level bread or you can make a little biscuit and they all have yeast in them. But back then they didn't know how to do that. And so they would take Somebody would buy yeast from a trader, or perhaps it was found back then, it was found around fungi. So you would go and find fungi around a tree, and you might find yeast that way. And you would mix it with your bread dough for whatever type of bread you're making. Then you would cut off a segment, put it in a bowl, cover it, and save that for next time. That way you don't have to get more yeast because once yeast hits sugar, it multiplies. So if you've put yeast and worked it into the dough, if you cut off a tenth of it, that has plenty of yeast for next time. Then you cook your bread. Then tomorrow you want to make more bread. So you get more dough and you make more dough. Then you take this small little yeasty part and put it in, and in a matter of an hour, depending how big it is, the dough will begin to rise, and then you can cut off a section and make your bread. And so saving a section of yeasted dough from generation to generation to generation to generation is how they got yeast into their bread all the time. There are two companies in San Francisco that claim, and I don't know if it's true, but they claim that their sourdough yeast starter that they are using today came in a covered wagon from back east in the 1840s and that they have been mixing it with their dough, saving a section, baking it, making more dough, putting it in, saving a section for, since the 1840s, And you can get original San Francisco sourdough, they say, from way back of when it came from the East. And so this is a known thing when Jesus is talking. And why does he talk about yeast? First of all, in the parable, he says the kingdom of God is like. So we know this is a kingdom of God parable. We know that Jesus is saying, here is a story, here is a event that is like one attribute or more of the kingdom of God. Last week we looked at the mustard seed, and the attribute Jesus was talking about was the kingdom of God started out really small. Jesus, when he was born, was the only inhabitant citizen of the kingdom of God on earth at that point. And it went from that one little baby to billions today. The kingdom of God has gotten huge, okay? And that is the story of the mustard seed that went from tiny to a huge tree. And so we have to look at this and understand what is the aspect. The kingdom of God is not yeast, 
but it acts like yeast. Yeast is a metaphor. Yeast is an illustration of something about the kingdom of God, and we can look at that. If you look at the Bible, and one way to look at a parable like this is you take the words in it, and leaven or yeast is one of the main words, and you look in your concordance, and it is a theme in the Bible. People are talking about it. God talked about it, God the Father, when the Jews were in Egypt. Jesus talks about it, Paul talks about it, about leaven, about yeast. And we have to ask the question, is yeast always the same thing? Is it always a one-to-one mapping to modern day? Everywhere, everywhere in the Bible, except this passage, yeast is either neutral or evil. Jesus says... Avoid the yeast of the Pharisees. It says that several times. When the Jews were leaving Egypt, God the Father said, Do not take any of the yeast from the Egyptians. That is why Passover today, Jews all around the world will rid their house of every speck of yeast because of the command back then. And when they make bread for the Passover, it's a cracker because there's no yeast. It is unleavened bread, which is why on communion, the little bread that we use symbolically on communion has no yeast. It is unleavened bread. It is a cracker in essence. And so... We have to ask the question, well, is the point of all this that yeast represents evil? Or we can say, is the point of all this the way yeast works in a loaf of bread is the same way evil and righteousness works in a person's life? Now, you can get 10 commentaries, and I do when I produce these sermons. And there's disagreement today. There's disagreement of very godly men. Some say, no, it always represents evil. Other people say, no, you've got to look at the process of how it's made. And if you find that, back in seminary, we would call them warring commentaries. Because you have these great pillars of Christianity. Great godly men. And they disagree about what this is, what the yeast represents in this parable. And that's fine, because Jesus doesn't give an explanation. And everybody who talks about this, who is a godly person who does their research, will always come to godly conclusions. Okay? I just think the process argument, which is John MacArthur's argument, is better for modern application. So I'm going to go that way. I'm going to say, if you, for example, what is the yeast of the Pharisees? The yeast of the Pharisees was hypocrisy and a works salvation. If you talk to a Pharisee 2,000 years ago, they would say, here's a list of things you have to do to please God. You miss one, and God hates you. That's what they would say. You have to get all 613, actually, that's how many they had, for God to love you. You had to work your salvation. You had to impress God with what you did. That was the snake oil that the Pharisees were selling, and it's a lie. It's wrong. God is a God of grace. There's no way a person can work their salvation. There's no way a person can work hard enough or good enough or righteously enough to impress God and be accepted. We are saved by grace through faith, through Jesus Christ. And so that's why Paul wrote the book of Galatians. You read through your New Testament and you come to Galatians and it's some of the strongest language, anti-work, pro-grace that is in the Bible because some 
students of the Pharisees had made it to Galatia and they were teaching false teaching. Now, if I believe that, let's say I sit at the foot of a works-oriented Pharisee, that will begin to put thoughts in my head. That will begin to cause me to think in a certain way that if I talk to Jesus and Jesus says, no, you're saved by grace through faith, I'm going to have a conflict in my thinking. Because how can a God who is righteous and holy accept me unless I do something? That was the argument of the Pharisees. And what Jesus is saying when he says avoid the yeast of the Pharisees is that once you get conflicting philosophies in your head, once you get conflicting philosophies in your thoughts, it's going to be difficult for you to choose one. And so the, the people were half Christian, half works, half Jewish, half Christian, and Paul says in Galatians, who bewitched you? Who cast a spell on you? This is so unnatural for people to be half this or half that. And so when Jesus is saying with the yeast uh, is the kingdom of God, we have to look at the, at the rest of the parables and say, well, well, what is people talking about when they say, here's the kingdom of God? And the answer is the gospel that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, and if you believe in that and in Him, then you are saved by grace through faith, and you have eternal life. That is the gospel message. That is the good news message. And if we go and knock on doors as we have, if we send out letters which we have explaining the gospel, our hope is that people who have not thought about eternal life much, will get this information and it will take hold. So when you put yeast in wheat dough, it eats the sugar and it produces gas and it produces more yeast and it molecularly changes the gluten in the wheat dough to give you the texture of normal bread. You can make corn muffins, and if you make real, honest, true, with corn, corn muffins, they have some yeast in them because they have little bubbles in them. But if you pick up a corn muffin incorrectly, you're going to have cornmeal in your hand, and it's going to fall apart because corn has no gluten to hold it together. Corn muffins are very fragile. Back in the day, back in Jesus' day, if you were making bread in your house, you would make wheat bread. That was how it was done. When Satan tempted Jesus and said, turn these stones into bread, Jesus thought, and Satan's thought was wheat bread. Okay, that's just, that was the normal. You can go to the store and get all manner of goofy bread today. But back then it was wheat bread. And what was Jesus' response? Jesus' response was, man shall not live by bread alone. He said that, that is from scripture. He said that because the prevailing view for the last, I don't know, going all the way back to the Egyptians, is that if you had a pantry full of bread, you could live through anything. You could be, it would be fine. And they didn't, you know, you go way back, they didn't toast their bread, they didn't butter their bread, they didn't put peanut butter on their bread. Just a loaf of bread. If you had five or six loaves of bread, your family could survive several months on that, the nutrition of bread was understood back then to be enough to sustain you. And so Jesus saying there is other things and the other things are the word of God. So you need physical food, bread, 
but that's not all you need. So yeast, when you put it in, uh, when you put it in dough, molecularly changes it. It changes the texture. Uh, we have watched the British Baking Show. The British Baking Show is a baking show, and Paul Hollywood is one of the judges, and he's the bread king of England. I, if you were in England, you would know that Paul Hollywood, that's the bread guy. And so several times throughout, they have to make loaves of bread. And they mix all the ingredients, including yeast, and then they put it in a proving drawer. And the proving, proving drawer is the right exact temperature and moisture for yeast to just take off. And so they take something that's this size, and they put it in a proving drawer, and they pull it out a half hour later, and now it's this size, Okay. It rises, it doubles or triples in size because the yeast has taken over and every aspect of this dough now has microscopic yeast in it. Every aspect of this dough has been affected by the yeast. The yeast has molecularly changed the dough and turned it into what we think of as bread, okay? The taste that you, you know, you eat some bread and you go, this doesn't taste right. How do you know it doesn't taste right? Because you've had bread a thousand times and it tastes like this and this one tastes different. And so it is the taste that we are used to actually comes from yeast. And so why did God tell the Jews to eradicate yeast when they were leaving Egypt. That was a symbol of leave behind all the Egyptian teaching. Leave behind all the Egyptian philosophies. Leave behind all the Egyptian gods. Leave behind all the Egyptian teaching because God was going to give them a new way and leaving all the yeast behind was a symbolic way of leaving all the Egyptian teaching behind. Now, mentally, they did not, because a couple weeks later, Aaron's building a golden calf at the base of Mount Sinai. The golden calf is an Egyptian god, and so they clearly remembered and didn't mentally remove all of that teaching. And so for the kingdom of God, for us, we can look at the dough, the three measures of dough, and it says, um, uh, like it, the woman hid in three measures of flour. Three measures of flour was a standard family amount of bread. If you were going to bake a bread, if you look in the Old Testament, when Abraham is making bread, he makes three measures of flour. Okay, so it was understood if you're making your own bread, and most people back then made their own bread, you would make three measures of flour worth because that would last long enough for your family to survive. So there's nothing special. Some people have said, aha, three measures, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. No, it's not. We, we don't do that. We just say, okay, three measures is normal, and when you hide it, it means you take the yeast part and you put it in the middle and you mix it around and then it grows out from there. And so what is the dough? What is the dough? If the dough is the whole world, let's look at the dough as the whole world. The gospel has been going out there to the whole world for 2,000 years. And today we talked last week about 2.5, 2.3, 2.8 billion Christians in the world. It's hard to count them. But if you look today and you say, okay, the dough's the whole world, there are Christians in every nation, in every country, in every language group, in every tribe. You can name a people group and the gospel has come to them. You can name a country, and there will be missionaries there. Some missionaries are secret. Missionaries risk their lives in places like Iran. 
to spread the gospel. But there, where it is illegal, if you are found to be a Christian in Iran, they shoot you in your house. They shoot you in the street. There's no trial. There's no nothing. Instant death if you are found to be a Christian, if you confess Christ. And there are Christians in Iran. If you want to grow the church, persecute it. In China, China used to have the, yeah, whatever view about Christianity and Islam, okay, back, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. Then uh, Chairman Xi put on his big boy pants and said, no, we're going to be communist, and Christianity can't work with communists. And he said, but I have an idea. We're going to arrest all the Muslims and we're going to put them in slave labor camps. So all the stuff that people buy, you know, all the stoves and phones and microwaves and stuff you buy from China, it'll be built for free by these Muslims. And that Christians kind of went, eh, that's not very good, but eh. Then he started arresting the Christians. And he's been arresting the Christians now for about three years. If you are found as being anything like Christian. You will be arrested and put in a concentration camp and you will work for the government for free as slave labor. And you say, well, that's not very nice. That's not nice at all. And it's not. But one person, and I have no idea how they got out, was released. A Muslim was released from Chinese slave labor and made it to England. And he did a series of interviews, and he said, when it was just Muslims, it was hateful, it was hate the government, how can we revolt, hate this, hate this, hate this. Then when the Christians started coming in, the Muslims that were building stuff next to the Christian began to think, huh, this isn't that bad. Because why? Because God was now in the prison camp. Because God said, I don't know what God's thinking, one possibility is, he said, there's unsaved Muslims in there and they're dying. So we've got to put Christians in there to get them saved. And they are. And the attitudes, even though they're slaves, and it's slave labor, in these camps is different. You put Christianity in a prison and it will molecularly change the prison. You put Christianity in a gulag in Soviet Union back in the day. It will change the gulag. You put Christianity in a Chinese prisoner camp, it will change the camp. Like yeast changing the dough, wherever you put the gospel, it changes it. Is everybody getting saved? Of course not. Are a lot getting saved? Eh, maybe. Are some getting saved? Absolutely. People are being saved left and right. In every prison, in every slave labor camp, in every bad situation you can think of. God is winning. And the communist government in China, for example, can't stop it. But what if the, the dough is you and me? Yeah, it's the whole world, but it's also the person. I am a blob of dough, as it were, and God puts the gospel in. And I am changed radically from what I was. If you go to 1 Corinthians 5.17, it actually says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All of the old has passed away, and everything is now new. These are the words that are used. They are all-inclusive. I don't just have one new thought. Everything is new. So if you're talking about the impact of yeast on dough, and then you're talking about the impact of the gospel on a person, it matches perfectly of how a person is radically changed down to the cellular level by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by what spiritually is being done in their life. We may look the same, 
Dough looks the same when you add yeast to it, but it's different. It tastes different. It'll cook different. It'll be different in totality. And so we are also, when we go from unsaved to saved, become brand new in the same way as yeast changes that. The gospel, therefore, changes everything it touches. Even people who fight it when they hear about the gospel. Some countries put people in jail or kill them if they're Christian. But yet, the gospel is still going. And the number of Christians in China since they started this persecution, we don't know exactly. We think it was 50 million Christians in China before the persecution. Now people are guessing that it's well over 100 million that the gospel is sweeping through all the places where there are bars and barbed wires and guards with guns. And that is what the gospel does. The gospel is not inert. The gospel is not meaningless. When people hear it, they are changed. When people, groups hear it, that group is changed. When countries have missionaries that go in, it changes things. The gospel changes everything it touches. And so when the gospel takes a hold of your life, you've got two choices. You can either play along. You can say, great, I'm saved. What do I have to do? Read your Bible, pray, go to church. Or you can say, I don't really trust God yet. And some people say that. They're saved and they don't really know what's going on. And so they begin to fight it a little, but God is going to save you, and God is going to sanctify you, and hopefully God won't be taking you to heaven kicking and screaming. Hopefully after a period of time, we will realize what we have and how great it is, and understand that we are saved by the power of the gospel. It is the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, and it is the same power that saves each of us and every person who hears it today, our God is mighty to save. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for this truth, for this understanding that your gospel is not of works. It is not something that is inert just sitting there, but it is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. And Lord, we praise you for that. I pray that we would be people who would get into your word that would understand what it means to be saved, that we would work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Lord, we praise you for that and ask your blessing upon this day and upon the lunch that is coming after. Lord, we thank you for all of these things and ask them through the blood of Christ. Amen.